I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join tears with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Two hundred fifty in your hymnal, two five zero. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Let's all stand together as we sing two five zero on that first. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee. Peace be still. Jesus, Jesus. singing this morning. Good to see you in church today. And uh, we had a wonderful uh, concert last night with the Down East Boys and a good, good time together. And uh, now we're looking forward to a good service together here today. Appreciate you making your way here this morning. Let's open with a word of prayer, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for another Lord's Day that you brought us to. And we bow before you in prayer here at the beginning of our service. And we want to thank you for the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the privilege that's ours to gather together here, the freedom we have in our country to still assemble in the name of Christ. And we pray, Lord, that you'll meet with us now this morning, that you'll help each of us to have our hearts open and yielded to what you would want to say to each of us today. Lord, we pray you'll control the music and our fellowship together, honor the preaching of the Word of God once again. Lord, we simply would ask that you would be pleased with the service today. That Christ would be lifted up, that all men would be drawn unto him. So control every aspect of our service, and may it be for your honor and glory. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. 411 in your hymnal, 411. I have a message from the Lord. Hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. 411 together on that first. I have a message from the Lord.
now a few announcements for us if you listen carefully, please. Um, we have our service tonight at 6.30. There's no 5.30 class this evening. Um, if you will excuse my wife and I. Um, we have a niece in Louisville, Kentucky that is getting married at 3.30 this afternoon. And so uh, that's about a three and, what, three hours and 20 minutes, three hours, 25 minutes. And so we have to get out of here pretty close to noon to get, make it to the church on time, all right? <laughs> and uh, so if you will allow us to, to, to just uh, kind of slip out right after the service, we're going to hit the road. Uh, tonight, 6.30, you're going to hit your evangelist, Freddie Dutton. Uh, Brother Dutton's been in ministry many, many years, a wonderful preacher. Uh, you're going to enjoy Brother Dutton tonight. Amen. So uh, be here in your place this evening at 6.30 uh, for the evening service. And then, uh, fellas, remember next Saturday morning at 8.15 is the men's breakfast. The sign-up sheet for that is downstairs, and uh, you sign up for that. And uh, make sure you get your name on there. We'll have a great time together at the men's breakfast this Saturday at 8.15. This doesn't sound quite right. Does it sound right? What do you got? You guys working on that? Are you? Okay. All right. And then, uh, so that'll be Saturday, and let's see. And then I want to talk about the ladies' high tea. That Now, ladies, this is in lieu of the mother-daughter luncheon that usually we have every year. Uh, it's just going to be called a high tea this year, and it's not just for mothers and daughters. It's for all ladies to come and young ladies. Uh, great program will be there, and uh, you're going you're gonna to enjoy this. It's going to be here in the auditorium. It's going to be decorated beautifully. You want to be a part of this, all right? And, uh, so if you can get your ticket right after the service, um, uh, Mrs. Wallace will be selling the tickets, and so see her afterwards and uh, get your reservation. Space is limited because we're in this, this auditorium here, and so you'll want to make sure you be a part of that on May the 2nd, okay? And then I want to say a word. Um, we, we talked about it Wednesday evening. We got word this week as they've been, we've had fellows, and many of you know, been working on our church bus, the, the big 72 passenger one. And um, it is, in the words of uh, car repair, bus repair, it is toast, okay? Um, it's, it's gone. Uh, it's beyond uh, repairable. And so we are in the process of trying to get ourselves another bus. Uh, Brother Warren Storm of Keep the Buses Rolling has put us in touch with some folks who have buses, and um, they can we can get a 2002 or three, I think it is, um, uh, bus for four thousand dollars. And I uh, uh, got some pictures sent to us of that, and uh, we we took an offering Wednesday night uh, for that, and we got just a shade over five hundred dollars on Wednesday night towards that bus. Uh, yeah. We're going to be receiving money today if you'd like to help us with the purchase of a bus we would appreciate that uh, today I got a text after I got home from church Wednesday night uh, from someone in the church who said they'll everything that's given on Sunday uh, up to a thousand dollars they'll match it so yeah. if we can raise a thousand dollars today then they'll match that to a thousand and we'll have two thousand yeah. all right so uh, if, if you could help with that project that the Lord put on your heart if you if you want an uh, envelope for that, there are envelopes on the back table back there. When we shake hands, if you'll grab one of those, uh, you can put it in there and just put bus on it. And then we'll put it towards that special offering uh, for our bus. Brother Lemke is doing a great job on the bus route with his wife. And they're uh, bringing kids in. And it's, it's going to get, it, 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 we just, we don't have any room in that little bus uh, to bring very many kids in. And uh, they, 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 we need that bus. And so. Trusting God that we'll get that money raised today and then be able to go get that bus this week and get it back here. And then it has to go through the, you know, we have to, in Ohio, you got to do stuff to it before you can put it on the road and uh, then get it inspected and all those good things. So uh, we want to get the process going on that. So if you could help, that would be a blessing. All right. Well, let's take a moment now. We'll welcome any guests we have with us today. We're always glad when folks will visit with us in the services. And if you're visiting this morning, Love to meet you and find out who you are and where you're from. And so if you're visiting here this morning and you're not a regular member here at Bible Baptist Church, or if you brought a guest with you, you could introduce them to us today. But would you mind us by standing for a moment and uh, we can find out who you are and where you're from. All right? Right down here, Doug has somebody with him. Fantastic. Great. Mariana, good to have you today. Thank you for coming. All right? Okay. Who else do we have? Back here, Rick. 
Oh, wonderful. Good to have you, Kathy. Thank you for coming here today. Great. Marvelous. Okay. Anybody else? Donna, you want to introduce them? Fantastic. Glad to good to have you. Thank you for being here. Good. All right. Harry, you got somebody with you? All right. Gee, good to have you today. Great. All right. Good. Okay. Now, if you'll take just a moment and fill out the welcome card, we sure would appreciate that. And a little bit, we have an offering, and if you'll just drop that card in the offering when it goes by, keep the pen as our gift to you for coming. We're glad you're here this morning. Let's give them all a warm welcome, shall we? Let's all stand together one more time as we sing.
feel welcome, especially our guests. We'll come back and take our last stand together. of love that I cannot know till I cross the narrow sea. Let's sing that last together. There are depths of love that I cannot know till I cross the narrow sea. There are heights of joy that I may not reach till I rest in peace with thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord. Sing that chorus one more time. We're going to sing it without the instruments. All together, lift that up. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer, nearer blessed Lord. said amen you can be seated when the ushers come be ready to receive our offering today brother linky spoke in my ear there when he came down from the choir uh that they had 18 on the bus this morning and it's only about a 12 passenger bus so i don't i'm not asking any questions i'm just rejoicing they had 18 uh on that little bus today so uh, uh just uh, appreciate uh doing what the lord lays in your heart to do and uh, help us with the purchase of that bigger bus. That'll be a blessing. All right. Let's pray for the offering this morning. Father, thank you for the privilege that's ours to give. And Lord, thank you for people who have a heart for God in this place. Lord, we're asking your blessing today, not only on the giving of your tithe and our offering, but particularly the special offering for our, our bus uh, today and this evening. Lord, we pray that not only will we uh, meet the need, but you would exceed the need, Lord. And we have to go over to Illinois to get the bus and bring it back and you know the expenses that will be involved God and I pray that you would meet that need as only you can we believe you're able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think 
and we, act, we, we look forward to what you're going to do and what you're going to provide in the way of a bus for us. Thank you for Brother Linke and his wife and the work they're doing on the route. Lord, I pray your continued blessing upon them and their labor for you. Bless this offering today now in Jesus' name. Amen. you to take your Bibles this morning, if you would please, for our scripture reading. Matthew chapter 5, if you would please. Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew 5, we're going to read the first 12 verses, and we read these responsibly. We'll begin together on verse 1, and I'll read 2, and we'll alternate until we end together on verse number 12. As our custom is, let's stand together for the reading of the scripture. And let's begin together on verse 1 of Matthew chapter 5. Ready? And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. And let's read 12 together also. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing now to the reading of the scripture here this morning. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your word that we can hold copies of it in our hand today. Lord, we don't believe it's just the words of men or the words of a man. We believe it to be in truth, the words of God. And I pray that your word would work effectually in our hearts today. Lord, please prepare our hearts and make our hearts fertile ground that the word of God will fall into and bring forth fruit in our lives. Help each of us to determine that we'll be doers of the word and not hearers only. Bless the special now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.
Our Heavenly Father, as we bow in prayer now this morning, we pray, Lord, that it will be our desire to be like Christ. Lord, my prayer would be that as a result of folks being in church this morning and hearing the Word of God and singing the songs of God and fellowshipping with the people of God, that all of us would be a little bit more like Christ. That as we leave this place in a little bit, that we would be more conformed to the image of your Son. It would be a little bit easier for people to see Jesus Christ in our lives. And so, Father, I pray that you would help me as I bring this message this morning, and please help the folks as they listen. Holy Spirit of God, do what only you can do in our midst here today, and be the teacher. Take the Word of God to each individual's heart. And Lord, I pray that we wouldn't just sit this morning and say, well, another message, another sermon and let it roll off our back like water rolls off the back of a duck. But the Lord, we let it penetrate our heart. We would ask you that speak to us and give us something from the message today that will make us a little bit more like Christ. So please help us as we look into the only book you've ever written. And we love you today, Lord. Speak to us. And I'll thank you for it. Amen. Matthew chapter 5, if your Bible's still open there, is what the beginning of what is called the Sermon on the Mount. It's just a sermon that Christ preached on the side of a mountain, and it takes up Matthew's 5, 6, and 7, three chapters that Jesus taught. Now, I want to make it clear, this is not telling, Jesus is not teaching here how to become a Christian, all right? Uh, this isn't, uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount is not about how to be saved, it is about how to live once you are saved. Uh, what Jesus gave here in the Sermon on the Mount, on the Mount where he is uh, dealing here with the blesseds or the happiness, are, he's saying, this is how those who follow me are going to live. This will be their characteristics. Someone said these are beatitudes. They're really be attitudes. They're attitudes that ought to be in our lives if we're followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, all through this time in Matthew, in this sermon in Matthew that Jesus gives, you'll, you'll hear him say things that you've heard it said by them of old. 
and he'll give an Old Testament quotation or something that the Pharisees would say. But then Jesus would say, but I say unto you. In other words, this is how the Pharisees live. This is how those who under the law want to live. But my followers, here's how you're going to live. And he lays out what our attitudes ought to be and how, what, what, ought to, what ought to come out of us because the gospel has been believed in us. All right? And by the way, when you believe in Jesus Christ and you trust Him as your Savior, He comes into our life. The Bible says by faith He dwells in our heart. And guess what? There's changes that take place in our life. And it becomes obvious to all that we begin to follow Jesus Christ. And when our heart is affected, it ought to affect our attitudes. It ought to be seen by others. And so there's three new attitudes that we're going to focus on this morning for our message today. And it begins in verse number 6, where the Bible says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. The first new attitude that Jesus gives us here, He said, fellows, you're going to have a new attitude that is upward. A new attitude that is upward. You're going to have a change in your desires. What is that? You're going to hunger and thirst for righteousness. You're going to hunger and thirst for God. You're going to have a hunger and thirst for the things of God. Now, this is interesting. This, this hunger and thirst here is not the kind of uh, thirst you feel just on a hot day. Uh, or if you, after you played a ball game on a hot day and you're, you're very thirsty and you want to get something cold to drink, it's the kind of thirst that you might feel after you've been in the desert for about three days and you haven't had anything to drink, and you're ready for a, even a drop of water. It's not the kind of hunger that when you just missed lunch, okay, or the kind of hunger you feel when you sat in church all morning, and then you go out for lunch on Sunday. I never have figured out what sitting in church had to do with making you so hungry on Sunday, but it happens that way. But it's not that kind of a hunger. It's the kind of a hunger that you've gone days without eating. It would be maybe closer to what we would say someone is parched or someone is starving. We use that word starving sometimes, but we don't know what starving is in America. All right? And Jesus said, Blessed are those who have that kind of a hunger and that kind of a thirst for God, for righteousness. One of, the, one of the, I think, genuine proofs of salvation is that you begin to have a desire to know God and a desire to please God. We talked about in our Sunday school class this morning that the Lord, one of part of salvation is, a, is regeneration. It literally means to be regened. Okay? You get, you get different genes when you get born again. And, and what it means, it means you, you get desires for God that you didn't have before you got saved. Why did you get up and think you ought to come to church today? See, what gave you that desire? That's because God put those genes when you were born again into you, and you got up and wanted to go to church. You know what? Before you were saved, you didn't think about getting up and going to church. You were, uh, there, there are a vast majority of people in, in the Columbus area this morning that are not in church. That's not their desire. They, 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 they still have the old genes. And listen, the old man, the old nature, the unsaved man, it, it, the Bible says he is at enmity with God. Doesn't, th this is not where they want to be and not the desire that they have in their heart. And so one of the proofs of salvation is we have a desire to know God and we have a desire to be right with God. It doesn't matter. Listen, there may be times you'll drift away a little bit, but that always pulls you back. It always brings you back. And you say, no, I, I, I know that it's not right. And listen, some of you have been there and you've lived through that and, and, and you get away from God and you know what? Man, you don't feel good. You feel miserable. You know you're not right. And there's always that draw saying, come back to God. And I know I need to get back to where I should be. I want to ask you a question this morning. Let me, we have a glass of water here. Isn't that a fine looking glass of water? How many of you, how many of you own a home? Let me see your hand. Well, you and the bank share it. That's okay. All right. How many of you would trade me 
I'll give you that glass of water and you give me your house. Nobody, huh? Huh. Now, you say, well, that'd be foolish for me to do that. And by the way, you wouldn't do that, but I, I, I believe there could be some circumstances under which you would make that deal. If you were thirsty enough and you had gone several days and you hadn't had any water at all and you felt like you're going to die, you say, in order to live, I'll give that house up. Give me that water. You see, when, when we want to know God and please God as much as you'd want to drink of that water, you will be filled. You will be satisfied. That's the promise that Jesus gave. That's the attitude that you get. You understand? Jesus said, Blessed are they that desire, that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. What did David say? David said, As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. He said, My soul thirsteth for God. For the living God. The man, I'm thirsting to know, not just about God. I want to know the living God. I want to know Him personally. Listen, don't let that fade. Not just a, not just a passing thought. Not just a, a, a passing fancy that I feel for a little bit and then it goes away. Over in the book of um, Hosea, the Lord says, O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? Listen. Your goodness is as a morning cloud, and as the early dew, it goeth away. He's saying, here's, here's, you, 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 you want to please me, and you want to live for me, and it lasts about as long as a fog in the morning, and then it burns off. It lasts about as long as the dew on the grass, and then it goes away. And God says, listen, that's not the kind of hunger and thirst God's talking about here. But it's a passion. It is a hunger, and it's a thirst that, that is not going to pass away. It's not a passing fancy. It, it, it motivates you. It, it's something that stays with you, and it demands to be fed. It demands to be satisfied. A person who really, you know, when you really want something, you don't just sit around expecting it to happen. When you really want something, you go after it. When you really, listen, when, when you wanted that one and you wanted to marry that one or you thought he was the one or she was the one, you didn't, you didn't just passively sit back. You decided, I'm going to make this happen. And you, you became actively involved in that. And you got motivated to make that happen. You have a hunger for God. Are you motivated enough to make that happen? to desire to want to know Him, not just know about Him, but to know Him, to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Maybe you need a new attitude that is upward, a passion for Jesus Christ. Now, there are some things you can do to help you get that passion. You've heard the old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And the old farmer said, yeah, but you can put salt in his oats and make him thirsty. You know, there's things we can do to salt our oats, if you will. You know, it's, it's interesting. When you get sick, there's, you know, when you, did anybody have the flu this past winter? Anybody get the flu? When you get the flu, and some of you had the real bad kind of flu, you didn't really feel like eating. In fact, several folks I, I spoke with, they had gone several days and hadn't had much to eat at all. They just didn't feel like eating anything. That, that, by the way, that's partially when you know you're sick. Whenever you have an animal, you have, how many of you have a dog at home? Okay? When your dog won't eat, you know something's wrong. He's not feeling well. Something's a matter. And that's the way it is with you and me as well. And And... What makes us, when we begin to not have a hunger and not have any desire for the things of God, something's wrong. Sin has come in and made us sick. And, and we're, not what we, we're, we're not where we should be. This morning, Brother Taylor testified in Sunday school that he'd been sick and he, he announced to everybody that he is just, he's just 100%. How about that? 
And, and that's good. But I wonder, how are you spiritually today? Are you 100% spiritually? Don't, don't allow sin to come in and want to feed the flesh because the flesh is never satisfied. You'll always want more and it will starve your spirit. It'll starve that part of you that wants to know God and wants to be with God. Sometimes the devil's choice with us to make us sick and to make us not want to desire the things of God is not just sin, but it's stuff, it's things. Easy to happen here in America. Things that, things that in and of themselves aren't sinful, in and of themselves may not be wrong, but we, when they begin to take the place of God in our life, they become wrong. You don't allow God to be in first place like He ought to be. Summer's coming. The weather's getting nice. Nothing wrong with a picnic or a trip to the park or going to a ball game or going out on the lake on your boat. But listen to me, my friend, when that takes the place of the church service, when that takes the place of where you are, what you ought to be doing for God, you are dulling your spiritual appetite. And you are taking away the things that you need. You're, you're killing your spiritual taste buds. And it's going to hurt you. Some of you, you, you can think about the time in your life when you've gone astray from God, and, and you know what I'm saying is true. Because that's what the devil used on you. Wasn't, wasn't a bad thing, but it became a bad thing. A lot of times when you begin to live for God, the, the choice is between something sinful and something that's right. The choice is between something that's good against something that's best. Something may be good, but if it's not the best, if it's not what God wants, then that good thing becomes a bad thing. And you can't let good become the enemy of the best. So you may have to deal with some sin or throw away some stuff and guard what happens. You know, the promise here that Jesus gave is, Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. You know, the great thing is, you can have as much of God as you want. You can hunger as much as you want, and He'll fill it. You'll never go away hungry when you're searching for God, and you're hungering for God. Draw nigh to God, He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. He says, if you draw nigh to God, listen, Everybody here in the room this morning is as close to God as you desire to be. When somebody comes to me and says, I just don't feel very close to God. Well, I tell you what, I, the problem is not on God's end. The problem's on our end. God says, I'm waiting for you to desire to draw nigh to me. And when I see you wanting to draw nigh to me, I'll draw nigh to you. Hey, when the prodigal said, I'm going home, he didn't even get to the house, did he? He only got on the trail, and who came running to meet him? Father did. Huh? That's God coming to meet you and me. If he just knows, we want to come towards him. Do you desire God? Do you hunger and thirst after righteousness? If not, listen, you need a new upward attitude where you desire the things of God and a change in your desires. Then he goes on in verse number 7 here in Matthew 5 where he says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. This is a new attitude that is outward. Mercy has to do with others. This has to do with a change in our disposition. Our disposition. Mercy is the way you treat somebody who's done you wrong. Anybody ever done you wrong? You don't. If you're past, uh, you know, six years of age, probably somebody's done you wrong. If you have brothers and sisters, I'll guarantee you somebody's done you wrong. But you know, here the Lord says you ought to have the attitude of mercy. It's what Stephen had when they're pummeling him with stones. And he kneeled down amidst the blows of the stones coming upon him. 
And he cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Same thing almost that Jesus said on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's really one of the truest tests of Christian character. Listen to me. I'm talking to Christians this morning that you wouldn't think of taking a drop of alcohol. You wouldn't think of going out on your wife or your husband and committing adultery. You would, you would, you would look at some of those sins that, that people would look at and say, man, I don't, wouldn't do any of those things. I'm a pretty good Christian. But there's somebody in your life, in your past, that has done you wrong, that if you had an opportunity to really get them for it, you would. You are unforgiving. And God knows that. And I asked you a question this morning. Is that having a merciful spirit? Is that having the attitude that Jesus speaks here about being merciful? Corey Ten Boom had spent years in the Nazi prison camp. Many times the guards would come in and beat her and her sister. And she said she always remembered one particular man. His face would stand out in her mind. Years later, she's speaking in a church. And in walked that man. She said, I'd know him anywhere. Fear gripped her soul along with a flood of very hateful emotions. And she later wrote in her book, right then and there, I had to learn that forgiveness is a choice. That man met her after that service and reached his hand out to her to shake her hand. And he told her this, he said, I've been saved and I want to ask you to forgive me for what I've done. And she looked at him for a minute. And that's when she said, I had to decide whether forgiveness is my choice or not. And by the way, it is a choice. Don't ever say, I can't forgive that person. They don't deserve it. You can do anything you choose to do with the help of God. You can do it. I can do all things through Christ. Why don't you be honest and don't say I can't forgive and why don't you be honest and say I won't forgive. Because that's closer to the truth, isn't it? And you can be bitter if you want. And you can make plans to try to get revenge or get even. But I'm telling you this morning, if you live that way, you're living and you're giving yourself a cancer that will eat you alive and it will kill you. Many, many bitter people in the world today because they've never forgiven somebody who'd wronged them. And you think you're punishing the other person by not forgiving them. And the truth of the matter is, you're punishing yourself. You're not hurting them. You're hurting yourself. Elizabeth Elliot, the wife of Jim Elliot, whose life was taken by the Aka Indians, he was subject of a, a, a movie that some of you have seen called The End of the Spear. It details the lives of these four missionary men and how they were martyred for Christ. A tribal native made her a widow, and, and at that time their son was 15 months old. But one day she came face to face with the same man who had killed her husband. He had gotten saved. And she forgave him. You see, if I'm, if I'm unmerciful to others who have done me wrong, then I'm thumbing my nose at the mercy of God who has been forgiving to me, who's done him wrong. What does the Bible say? It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not what? Consumed. You ever thought, why doesn't God just rub me out? 
the stuff I've done against him, and, the, and by the way, repeatedly. Hmm? You know why? Because he's merciful. How can we not be merciful? What does he say? What's the promise? Blessed are the merciful for what? They'll obtain mercy. They'll obtain mercy. You want, do you want people to be merciful to you? You have to sow mercy. Show it and sow it. <laughs> Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Well, I'd like to reap some mercy. Sow some. Well, I'd like people to be forgiving of me. Sow some forgiveness to others. Blessed are merciful, they shall obtain mercy. You'll enjoy mercy yourself. Because the truth of the matter is, we already have. If you've been forgiven by God. So we have a new attitude upward. That's a hunger and a thirst for God. We have a new attitude that's outward. That's a new disposition to others. We're going to be merciful. And then thirdly, notice in verse number 8, we get a new attitude that's inward. It's a new devotion. He said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Biblically, you have to understand what the heart is. Okay, In, in our mind, it's very difficult to, to when we read the word heart in the Bible to get away from that thing that's pumping in our chest. Okay? Now, the truth is it's, it, it is the core of our being. And the Bible says a man believeth in his heart for salvation or for righteousness. You know what I mean? That, that it's the core of your being. All right? And, and by the way, the center of our life, if, if, if that thing inside your chest, if that stops beating, you're in trouble. Okay? You're not long for this life. You're not long for here. Uh, so that's, that's why it's called, I think that's why it's called the heart. That is really important. But it's when, when, when you're talking to somebody and you're talking about a certain subject, you say, well, listen, let's get to the heart of the matter. You want to get to the core of this thing. What is going on? It's the fountain of who you are. Yet it's also the seat of all our emotions. And by the way, it's also the place where sin originates in our lives. Jesus said this, Matthew 15, 19, For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murderers, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. Say, so why, why do I want to tell a lie? Why do I want to be untruthful? Why do I want to, you know why? Because our heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. It comes from the heart. Somebody has a, somebody lets off some curse words and they say, oh, wow, you know, excuse me. Or they say, I don't know where that came from. I always, I always say, I do. Where did that come from? came from your heart. came from your heart. Because that's what Jesus said. It's out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. One of the biggest lies that goes on that some of mankind is waking up to is that they think that, Man's in trouble because of his environment around him. We listened a week ago to the head of the Department of Corrections in the state of Ohio at a, at a meeting that the Department of Corrections put on. And he said the, the statement that we've, we've learned that, that the heart of the human problem is a problem of the heart. He said we're learning that the secular programs that we have in the prisons they're not getting the job done because they don't reach the prisoner's heart. And so they're learning and they want the faith-based programs to come in because we know that changes the heart. And if you don't change the heart, you'll never change a life. And so they're finally, the light bulb's coming on. Now listen, my, my response to him is simply this. Hey, I, I'm for it. You got 56,000 prisoners in the state of Ohio. You, you got to do something to try to help them not to keep coming back and be repeat offenders. But listen to me. Why are we sending the ambulances at the bottom of the cliff? Why don't we put a fence up at the top of the cliff and not let them fall off and go to prison? How, how come we're saying now that they're in jail, we got to reach their heart, but when they're in kindergarten and first grade and second grade and third grade, we say they don't need God, they don't need the Bible, they don't need Ten Commandments, they don't need anything that will affect their heart for good and for God. And, and if we don't give them that there, why are we surprised when they end up in prison? 
Why don't we prevent the problem instead of trying to just cure the problem? They think education will solve any problem. You take a thief and educate his head without changing his heart, all you get is a smarter thief. Instead of putting on a mask and robbing the liquor store, he'll get a job with uh, some corporation and he'll embezzle the money because he's smart. It's not the environment. Adam and Eve were in a perfect environment and they still sinned. It's not education. And we've thrown money at education for years now. Education's not the answer and not the problem. It's a problem of the heart. When the Bible says here, blessed are the pure in heart, it means a sincere in heart. It means there's nothing hidden. There's no hypocrisy. You know what it means? It means what you see is what you get. What Jesus was referring to here is the Pharisees. The Bible says that Jesus warned them, you, were, you may clean the outside, and you outwardly appear everybody to be righteous, but inside, he said, you're full of dead men's bones. You're as filthy and as wicked inside as you can be. Think of, think of walking into some elegant restaurant and sitting down where they have nice, clean tables and they have a nice white tablecloth on the table and napkins folded up in a linen cloth. and I mean, uh, the silverware folded up in that linen cloth and you're sitting down looking at the nice uh, china and the stemware that's there. And you think, boy, what a nice place. And then pretty soon it, you see people walking in and they look, look official and they're shutting down the restaurant. You say, man, what are you shutting down the restaurant for? They said, have you seen the kitchen? And the health department comes in to shut down because of the filthiness that's in the kitchen. It's not the dining room that's the problem. It's what's in the kitchen. Hey, listen to me, friend. It's not what people are looking at outside. It's what's in here that God's looking at. Later on, Jesus is going to say, your father which seeth in secret shall reward you openly. God says, I, I'll, I'll give you the blessing not on what you appear to be in public, but what you are in private when nobody sees. The pure in heart says what you see is what you get. Simply means be forthright, be honest, and, and keep a clean slate. They used to call it keep short accounts with God. Keep things confessed to the Lord. Keep things confessed to others. When you've been wrong, ask forgiveness. Admit you're wrong. And, and, and what happens is when you live that way and you live honestly and you live without hypocrisy and you live uh, not, not trying to ever uh, hide things and be a double life, you know what the Bible says? It clears your vision. It's like a good set of wipers on your windshield. Huh? Blessed are the pure in heart for what? They shall see God. You see God work in your life? Be clean. Keep the way clear. Let nothing between you. Keep that, keep that purity of heart. Because when you do that, you'll see God. And I know that, that that may be referring to a future event, but I think it's a present day thing. Jesus later on would say, you, you, it's so easy to see the speck in somebody else's eye and we miss the beam coming out of our eye. Remember that? In other words, it, Jesus let us know, we all, it, it's all easier for us to find fault in somebody else than to see it in our own life. But Jesus said, listen, you get the beam out of your eye, and he said, then you'll be able to see clearly. Then you'll be able to see clearly. The whole idea is to see clearly. The whole idea is not to have any obstruction. And that obstruction, nothing muddies the water more than an impure heart, than hypocrisy, than appearing to be something you're not. Be honest with yourself. Don't just, don't listen. You, you have to be honest with God. He knows about you anyway. But listen, don't lie to yourself. When things aren't right, make them right. Be clean and honest with your own heart. That's why there's an altar. 
That's why there's confession of sin. That's why the Lord says, not only will I forgive you, I'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I'll cleanse you. I love the story that Brother Currington tells in, about his little girl and about this idea of cleansing. <clears throat> A lot of people will ask forgiveness of sin but never feel cleansed by God. But I want to remind you, when you ask God to forgive you and you ask Him to cleanse you, He'll do it. And here's the illustration Brother Currington gave. He said he was getting ready for church on a Sunday morning and his little girl, uh, he got her all ready and she had her pretty dress on and her hair and pigtails and everything and looked real nice. And she said, Daddy, uh, he wasn't dressed yet. And she said, can I go outside and play? And he said, no, honey, it rained last night. It's still kind of muddy out there. I don't want you going outside. You'll get mad. She said, okay. And he went on and started getting dressed and he got himself ready and he came to the top of the stairs and she was calling for his name and she started crying. And he looked down, and there she was, muddy from the top of her head to the bottom of her feet. She went outside. I'm sorry, Daddy. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. He said, what am I going to do? He said, of course I can do it. He said, but I picked her up, brought her upstairs, took that muddy dress off, took those muddy shoes off, put her in the bathtub, cleaned her up, washed her hair, blue dry the hair, fix her hair up, put it back in pigtails, put a brand new dress on her, put new shoes and socks on her, and got her ready for Sunday school. He said, I forgave her, but I also cleansed her. He said, why'd you do that? Because he said, she's going to Sunday school, and nobody at Sunday school needs to know she was in the mud. Hmm? You know what God does? God, God forgives you, God cleanses you, and no one else needs to know you were in the mud. So many times we, we, we still feel guilty. We still feel unclean because we're rehashing our sin against God all the time too. Hey, once it's forgiven and you're cleansed, it's done. It's done. And not only do you not need to think about it, you don't need to tell others about it either. It's over. Move forward. They shall see God. It's not just enough to enter the kingdom of God. It's not just enough to be saved and that's all that matters. No, 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 no. Jesus teaches us here it matters how we live. And, and if we believe the gospel and we've trusted Christ as our Savior, hey, then that expresses itself in our life. It affects the way we live. And that's what Jesus is getting at here. It's not just to be a follower. It's to express the followership in our life. So others see. So it so so God shows through our life. How's he do it? With a different upward attitude. They see that we have a desire, we have a hunger and a thirst, a a, a real desire to please God and to know God. That consumes us, it motivates us. We have a different outward attitude. We're merciful in dealing with others. We extend mercy to people. We, we permit people to wrong us. Knowing that as we want mercy, we better extend mercy. And then we get a different attitude inwardly. Honest with myself and honest with God. Being pure in heart. God desires truth in the inward parts. If you're here today, and listen, you know Christ is your Savior, why don't you ask God to let these attitudes come true in your life to show that you're a follower of Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, He's here today. If you call upon Him, He'll save you. We trust you'll make that decision this morning. Let's bow together for prayer, shall we? Father, <clears throat> take the truth now today. Thank you, Lord, for the plainness of the truth here in the Sermon on the Mount. Thank you, Jesus, for speaking these words that we still learn, are learning from 2,000 years later. And Father, I pray this morning that you have spoken to the hearts of your people today. That you've walked up and down these aisles and in and out of the rows and you've stopped at every occupied seat. And I pray, Lord, that those who have put their faith in Christ and would say, yes, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, 
would desire to have these attitudes characterize their life. That that fellowship of Jesus would show through in a new upward attitude, a new outward attitude, a new inward attitude. And then, Lord, I pray for those in the room who have no assurance that if they die, they'd go to heaven. That they never have personally put their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior. That today would be the day they would call upon Jesus and they trust Him as their personal Savior. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'll finish the prayer in just a moment. How many folks here this morning? Just between you and God now. I wonder how many people in the room would say, Pastor, if I died today, I know for sure that I'd go to heaven. There's a time in my life when I know that I trusted Jesus as my Savior. And I know that I've been born again. I know that if I died today or if I... If Jesus came back, I'd go to be with him. Here's my hand as a testimony. Would you slip it up for a moment and say, Pastor, I know that I'm saved. All right, you may put it down. There's somebody here today who would say, Pastor, I don't know that for sure. I, I don't have the assurance, I don't have that peace in my heart that if, if something were to happen to me, that I would wake up in heaven. Say, Pastor, I'd like to know that. And my friend, you would like to know that. Would you let me pray for you? I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out, but I'll pray for you. Would you slip your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me this morning? Is there someone like that? Raise your hand. Say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm not sure. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else today would join these? You couldn't raise your hand the first time, but you'll raise it this time and say, Pastor, pray for me this morning. I wonder how many believers here today. That's really who the message is for. Are these attitudes in your life? I wonder if the Spirit of God stopped at your seat and dealt with your heart this morning about allowing the attitudes to show through in your life. Do you hunger and thirst after God and after righteousness? Are you merciful? Do you have that different outward attitude? Will you ask God to help you with the inward attitude? I wonder if you're a believer here this morning and say, Preacher, the Spirit of God dealt with my heart. I need these attitudes in my life. I'm asking God to make them evident and to make me sensitive that these show through in my life as a follower of Jesus Christ. Pastor, pray for me this morning. Will you slip your hand up, Christian? Yes. Amen. Amen. You may put them down. Thank you. In a moment, I'll pray, and we'll have our invitation. If God has spoken to your heart today, I want you to respond to him. Listen carefully. If you're just here today as a Christian, you need to come and pray and ask God to put these attitudes in your life, then do that. To give you that hunger and that thirst that you ought to have for God and the things of God. Maybe there's things that have gotten away. It's taken away your spiritual taste buds. You don't hunger like you used to. You don't thirst like you used to. Things have taken their place. Why don't you come and get that thirst back and that hunger for God? If you're here today and you've never received Christ as your Savior, listen very carefully. When we stand to our feet, I'll pray in a minute. We'll stand to our feet. The pianist will play. Brother Bob's going to sing. And if you're here today and you've never received Jesus, all I want you to do is just come right here to the front. I'll be standing right here. We have people who've been trained. They'll take a Bible, and they'll show you in just a few moments how you can know Christ as your Savior. Don't put that off. If you're here and you're saved and you've never been baptized, you ought to come and say, I need to be baptized. If you're saved and baptized and you, you think this is where God would have you belong, why don't you come and unite membership with the church? Whatever it is, you just want to come and kneel to the altar and pray. Do what God's telling you to do this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for speaking to hearts today. Thank you for these hands that have been lifted this morning, indicating you've spoken to their heart. And, Lord, I would pray your will be done now in the next few moments. Here at this altar, those who need to pray, to pray, and those who you've spoken to their heart, 
those in the room who've never received Christ, may they come. Let someone take a Bible and show them how they can walk out the door in a few minutes with the peace of God in their heart that they're on their way to heaven. Have your way now in every heart and life in these next few minutes, and I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, the pianist plays. She plays. God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this morning, will you please? Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior. And life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace through death into life everlasting he passed and we follow him there over us sin no more hath dominion for more than conquerors we are turn your upon Jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace his word shall not fail you he promised Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Sing that chorus together, will you? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light. Appreciate your attention this morning and uh, have a young lady uh, being dealt with for salvation and so we'll let her deal with her and not rush that uh, important decision but uh, pray for Ariana as you leave this morning all right that the Lord will open her heart and uh, she'll receive Christ as her Savior today okay and uh, listen have a wonderful afternoon uh, pray for us as we travel and uh, head down to the wedding and uh, we'll certainly be praying for you folks and uh, I look forward to, to uh, later on this evening watching the service and hearing Brother Dutton and uh, be in your place and uh, uh, thank you again for giving to the bus and he'll, he'll include tonight as well so if you came today and you weren't prepared to, to give something and you'd like to do it this evening that'll be fine and uh, let's pray that God will take care of that need. Amen.
All right, let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you so much for the privilege. It's ours to gather together here on a Sunday. Thank you, Lord, for meeting with us this morning. Lord, it sure has been good to be in, in church this morning. Thank you for the people of God in this place and for the good spirit that we sense here in the room this morning. I pray for Ariana as she's being dealt with now that you'll open her understanding and open her heart. That Lord, she'll receive the gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, Father, give us a good afternoon and Lord, bring us back this evening. Be with Brother Dutton tonight. Give him exactly the message that we would need for this evening's hour. And we'll thank you for it now. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Um, I just thought, uh, Diane Stiltner, the tickets for the mother-daughter thing, you take care of that since Miss Wallace is dealing with her, okay? So you see Mrs. Stiltner there for your tickets for the uh, ladies' tea on May 2nd. She'll be down there in the foyer, all right? All right, let's sing I'm So Glad I'm a Part of the Family of God. Brother Bob. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Joined heads with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Amen. You're dismissed. We'll see you back tonight.